from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to see you all here tonight. Uh, my name is David Plyler. I'm in the, uh, in the music division. I'm a music specialist there. And uh, we have a, a real treat for you uh, for our pre-concert conversation this evening. Uh, we have composer and pianist uh, Frederick Zhevsky, who will be performing tonight as, uh, his own music, uh, which will be, uh, we'll have a chance to hear uh, two piano pieces as well as the world premiere of a new piece for violin and piano. So we'll talk a bit about that. Um, and I also have Charlton Lee, who's the violist with the Del Sol String Quartet. And they've been with us all week doing really excellent work uh, using our instruments. And uh, last night they performed uh, uh, the String Quartet from 1955. And we'll, we'll, we'll speak a bit about that as well. Um, so if you could just uh, join me in welcoming our guests. I'd like to start with something that's a bit unusual um, for me, which is not a question, but rather a statement. And this is that uh, I had the opportunity in 2012 to put, to put together a chamber concert um, in South Africa at the Grahamstown Festival, which is uh, kind of an obscure part of South Africa. And uh, we programmed Coming Together at that uh, per performance. And what was an interesting thing that happened was that when we gave the performance, we had this huge uh, upswell of uh, gratitude and uh, thanks from the audience for that particular piece. And people had come in from all over the place just to hear that piece. Um, I thought it was the Dalla Piccola that we had also programmed, but it wasn't that. But, um, <laughs> although that was also a nice piece. Um, but there, it, it spoke to me at a, at a time that, that there's this element to your music. And it's, of course, you write lots of different music that tends to uh, reach many different types of people. And I, I just thought that I'd share that as a starting point, um, that, that I had a very positive experience with that, in that light. Um, I'm glad to hear that. I, I, I didn't know that. But do you know why people do <laughs> <laughs> This I do not know. Uh, but, they, um, but they just uh, said that they were fans of your music. And so just it wasn't often performed there. So it was I, a, probably not. Yeah, so it was a chance to, chance to hear it. I think um, hearing, hearing music live is just uh, also one of those things that um, they greatly value. Well, I, it's funny because I had a similar experience in Athens. I went to Athens uh, a little more than a year ago. And a lot of people came to my concert. Uh, and it turned out most of them were anarchists. <laughs> <laughs> and that this piece had been played a number of times in Athens. And of course, the guy who wrote the text was himself an anarchist. Mm -hmm. So there was some connection there. And there, uh, there, uh, in Athens, there are lots of anarchists. I'm sure. <laughs> But uh, more than that, I don't know. I'm not sure their particular affiliations, but they certainly enjoyed the, the music and the performance, to be sure. Well, good. <laughs> well, um, I thought we'd start with, uh, I don't know if, how many people in this audience were able to come to the concert last night, but we had a very, oh, good, good. I'm glad to see that some of you were able to. Um, it was a very unique experience, and not just for us, the audience. Um, but also for you, I would imagine, um, in that there was a, a piece that you had written when you were 16 or 17. That's right. And both, actually. You took both me. <laughs> just took, took me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I guess I'm just wondering what that experience would be like. To You hadn't ever had a chance to hear. You had your experience with it and composing it. Clearly invested a lot of energy and investment of time and, and thought into it. Well, I was, I was a student, mm -hmm. and I didn't know anything about anything, and I still don't, actually. <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, string quartet, I, I, I don't, I, you know, I only knew, I listened to a lot of records, 
but I, I never played as, I mean, I tried to play the cello once, and uh, I even tried the viola, but, uh, you know, there's a kind of fundamental uh, gap between keyboard players and, you know, it's two completely different universes. And of course, the thing about a piano or a keyboard instrument is that it's a machine a labor-saving device for playing lute music. <laughs> <laughs> well, historically, that is, in fact, the case, uh, because the lute is a notoriously difficult instrument, as I guess you, you know. Right. <laughs> and uh, as the keyboard was developed as a way of making it more available. I mean, and you can see that in Renaissance paintings. It's uh, the lute. Only angels play lutes. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, but everybody can play a keyboard instrument. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what it is, and so, so, I mean, but, you know, I, 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 I don't know how I got into it, but anyhow, uh, what I really wanted to say was that your performance was spectacular. Thank you. I mean, uh, it really was. <laughs> I had never heard your quartet before, but it is, uh, it's really fantastic. Thank you very much. And, uh, aside from the fact that you obviously worked very hard on this particular thing, I can see that you're, you know, a real quartet, and uh, th those things aren't so common these days. But so I'm going to definitely check you out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thanks anyway. I mean, it was fantastic because my piece is, uh, you know, basically, you know, just a student exercise. It's not so bad, but it isn't really that. <laughs> not at all. But I wouldn't it's, say it's your standard student exercise. I don't know too many 16, 17 year olds who would really. Well, uh, Mendelssohn comes to mind. <laughs> well, you know, I was trying to be avant-garde also and so forth, and uh, you know, I was trying to do all kinds of things, but without really knowing how to do, how to do them. And it's just as well it waited 60 years to be performed, because uh, if it had been informed then, been performed then, then probably some professor would have said, look, you know, take, take this stuff out, you know. <laughs> you can't have these glissandi, you know, that's ridiculous. And in fact, they, they are ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> the, but the, the extraordinary thing about your performance was that you, you, you did exactly what's written. Well, we, we thought about it and we, we said, well, he was 17, and he probably <laughs> said, I don't care. <laughs> so we did it. <laughs> yes, you know, I mean, I didn't expect that. I expected that you were going to, like, you know, <laughs> smooth ah. out the, <laughs> the, the uh, funny parts. I, I think because we work so much with living composers, we're used to just starting from the point of doing exactly what's on the page and then you know if they think it doesn't they don't like it we can they can change it and we'll then we'll change it well that brings up a, an interesting question Charles and with the um, the process of preparing this particular piece you know that you're going to have the opportunity to speak with the composer but it's at such a remove that it's really like everybody's coming to this piece as if it were a new piece did that affect the way you or did you still just go at it just as if it were a new piece that's put in front of you. Well, we still, tr uh, we treat every piece that way. And so even the, the, the two pieces on these programs by the, the, the composers who are deceased, mm -hmm. the Crawford and Antile, we, we still approach them as if they're living. And then, mm -hmm. and then like for example, the other day when you brought out those manuscripts, that was a treat. And mm -hmm. then we can look at, and you know, they have notes written. It's like, mistake here. Um, tempo change here. It's like all this great information. And then we, of course, you know, copy them over. <laughs> and actually, I think you did some adaptations based on uh, a little minor. We, ones. we did, yeah. yeah. There was some in the Antile, let's see. The, when we recorded the Antile, we, we had, um, there was one notation where he had crossed out one section. And, but this time around, we felt like actually it makes sense with it. So, well, you can tell us tonight if it works or not. But <laughs> so we kept the whole thing this time. Yeah, it's all the way. It's all what he wrote the first time around. Mm -hmm. The Crawford is extraordinary. I didn't know this piece. It's it's incredible. Especially the second movement. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's no, that really is, uh, I mean, that was an eye, uh, ear opener for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, she, we, we, we were talking, as we were working in depth on this piece, we were saying that um, because she, she knew this young fellow at the time named, um, uh oh, now I, I'm, I'm blanking on a very. Um, you mean knew him? Mr. And... Mr. Elliot Carter. Ah. So he was her um, kind of a, you know, he was a younger composer who was kind of hanging out with them a little bit. Them who? Uh, the Seekers and, and other Both people. Both of them? I think so, yes. But this was before she was married? I'm not sure exactly when. It says so in the program. Oh, okay, there you go. Yeah. So, and, oh no, this piece, for sure. This piece. This but, was written a year before she was that's married. That's right. Which is, a, a, you know, normally is not so significant, but I mean, the only thing I really know about this woman is that she basically stopped composing. It's a pity. Well, it, I'm not sure what, what that's all about, but uh, right. it's not unusual, of course. The same thing was true of Mahler's wife. Right. Same thing. That's right. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's uh, I presume might probably very common, in, you know. Right. It's definitely a complicated issue that has been written about uh, quite a bit recently. Um, uh, Judith, Judith Tick definitely approaches it in her biography and some right. essays about it. Um, but but yes, but um, Carter wasn't. I believe his first string quartet was actually influenced by. I by think a lot of his ideas yeah. were influenced <laughs> by this piece. By this piece. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Uh, a lot of the the polyrhythms and and the the, the voicing voices crossing and, and all this kind of stuff. But he didn't start doing that kind of thing until, until about fifteen until years about, later. <laughs> yeah, well, more than that. Yeah, more more. Right. Because up until 1950 or so, he was writing sort of your standard right. neoclassic Americana kind of thing. Yeah. Mm. Well, was this, uh, when you, going back to when you wrote the string quartet, was that the first writing for strings that you had done? Or had you, had you done some practice pieces before that for other versions of the ensemble? Oh, wait. For you, sorry. <laughs> when you when you first wrote that string quartet, was that your first attempt at writing for strings, or or was that? Um, oh no, 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 it doesn't no. Sound like there it. are some other unperformed. <laughs> <laughs> we can make a business out of this. <laughs> uh, in fact, I mean, you know, I I I, I stopped writing for strings because no no string players were interested and that's still true today oh. nobody is interested uh, in uh, nobody is interested i mean uh, look you probably wouldn't have done this un unless you had been hired to do it let's, <laughs> let, let's face it i mean uh, string players are just not interested, as a rule, in new music. I mean, your group may be exceptional, but the rule is, uh, you know, I mean, even in conservatories, I know well that many teachers tell the students, don't play new music because it will ruin your technique. Actually, for our case, it would have been, if we were disinterested in the piece um, without being hired, it would be because it was old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. If you had, if you had a new quartet, we'd we'd be all over it. Well, I do. Oh, you do. Ooh. <laughs> Let's talk. This has all been elaborate setup. For... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, yes, it's true. I mean, uh, you know, but you, you, you look. You have to admit that I'm right. <laughs> no, you're right. Some string quartets maybe will play, let's say, Philip Glass or something like that, okay? Be why? Because they know there will be an audience. And this is a perfectly good reason. But uh, I suppose one good reason for not playing new music is because there's really not very much that's any good. Well, that, that's, that, that happens to be also true. But how many, how many uh, string quartets, for instance, since we were speaking about Elliot, how many string quartets play his work? How many? Can, just off the top of your head. Uh, for sure, the Pacificas. Yeah, but how many <laughs> string quartets will, will actually play this stuff? I'm not sure. Not, probably too probably not too many. Yeah, probably not too many. Of course, it's difficult. Yes. 
But, you know, any string quartet music that's any good is, is has, you know, yeah. Beethoven too. So, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's not a, these two things don't really sit comfortably with each other. I mean, you, your group may be an exception. I would say that they are, because they, they have a great track record of really promoting, especially living composers and doing uh, uh, great work with their music. Also with some of the, uh, the music that's a, a bit more obscure that we don't hear as often, like the Antile, they have a collection of the, all of his string quartet music. Oh, really? Yeah. You've recorded? Right. Well, of course, he, he, he is a, a, a deserves to be much better known than he is. And he has a for undeservedly not very good reputation. Uh, and even even I didn't really know the work very well, and I still don't until fairly recently. Until I realized that you know this guy actually wrote interesting music. It's hard to say why. Anyway, let's not stare. This well, yeah, is this yeah. subject. The subject is getting too. This is getting too pessimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe we can look at uh, some of your piano music. So moving away from strings, you're also going to be playing some solo piano works tonight. Yes. Um, maybe you can share a few things about, about these particular pieces or the types of piano music. All right, here, now we're coming to the part that I like. You know, I suggested to David, how we're, what are we going to do on this talk? And I said, well, what easy way of dealing with it is to let the audience talk. So maybe somebody has something to say. Sure. Yes. If you can, uh, if you don't mind, uh, we'll take a. Why don't you take this microphone? If Jay is. Jay back there? Well, here's what we have here. I mean, you uh, said that um, conservatory teachers tell the string players not to play the new string quartets because it will ruin their technique. What did you mean by that? I, I just know what I what I heard. I just know what I. What I heard, and I used to teach in the, in the Liège Conservatory myself, and uh, actually the Liège Conservatory in Belgium has a long history of, uh, you know, association with the uh, violin. Uh, people like, uh, you know, all the famous, you know, Isai and all these people, you know, they were all connected with that. So they 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 have a long history of, you know, string t string teachers and so on, and. Uh, People told me that, that uh, the, you know, the teachers told them, uh, told the students, you know, stay away from modern music because it will ruin your technique. And it may be true for all I know. You know, uh, maybe, maybe you know, if you you, you guys play Sul Ponticello very convincingly, but what is it like when you play Mozart? We don't use Sul Ponticello. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I mean, the Kronos Quartet is well known for playing new music, for better or for worse. But I also heard them play classics, and they don't do it very well. Or at least they didn't when I heard them, which was some time ago. And uh, maybe it's true, you know, maybe it's true that uh, if you're going to play the classics correctly, you should stay away from uh, this other stuff. I happen to think that it would actually just expand your palate, but but th it is a common trend that a lot of conservatory teachers um, have their students focusing so primarily on the classics that they don't have time really to explore beyond that, and so a lot of them. Um, we were just at where was it? Oh, we were just at Peabody last week give me a class, and I think people were a little scared by some of the pieces that we played because they had never heard anything like that before. Um, and some of it was not even that far out. Um, so it, it's, it's really, and, and that's not unusual. I think it's quite common now that a lot of the students, if they want to explore contemporary music, they have to go outside of the school to access it. I think there's yeah. Okay. I just I think there's also different populations uh, of there's different teachers offer different things to their students. At conservatories, I mean, the the root of that is conservative. No, <laughs> I beg to differ. Okay. 
In fact, maybe somebody in the audience, I heard so already some uh, 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 gesture of protest. Does somebody, can somebody tell us what this word actually means? No, huh? Well, I often, you know, talk to my students about this. Well, I, have, I lived in Italy for a long time. So the word is conservatorio. Now, what is a conservatorio? It is an orphanage because in the Middle Ages, uh, the church, you, could, there, you can still see them in certain places. Uh, in Padova, for example, in front of the Cathedral of St. Anthony, there is a curious rotund structure which has a little door on it, and there's a kind of lazy Susan inside the door. Now, the whole point of that is that behind the door, on the other side, behind it on the other side, there's a similar door with a nun waiting. And uh, what you do is, if, if you have a child which you really can't afford to bring up, instead of throwing it in the river, you take it to the church, put it in there, and on the other side, the nun takes the baby, and that's it. You never make eye contact or anything. And so many children were saved or conservati in this way. So the, the place where, which receives these children and the, there is a conservatory or a place where they are saved. And of course, uh, uh, the, the church brings them up and teaches them to do things like decorating the church, singing in the choir. So many of the famous uh, painters of the Renaissance and musicians were <laughs> saved in this way. And only in the 18th century did Cherubini go to Paris and start the first conservatoire, which, which then was, became a music school. But that's not what the word means. I wasn't really trying to say that's what it means, but it certainly is one of those things that one finds in a conservatory. Well. That happens to be a, an accident of language that <laughs> conservatories tend to be conservative. But, but it's not, nothing, nothing really good structurally. To point out. Huh? Good to point out, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can we go back to your piano playing in terms of what, um, I, I just want to know a bit more about the types of music that you've been writing lately uh, for solo piano. Well, what would you like to know? Anything you'd like to tell us. I, I... Well, you can hear a lot of it. Just go on, uh, on uh, IMSLP, and uh, uh, most of my music is there, up for grabs. You can uh, download the scores and the recordings, free. So if you're interested, you know, you can do that, yeah. Uh, the question was, how do I make a living, or should I? No, we, you, we got it now. Okay. Uh, this way and that way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't make much of a living, but I manage to survive. And uh, one of the ways I make a living is like thanks to this place. Uh, I got a nice commission to write these pieces that we're going to hear tonight and uh, tomorrow. Uh, so so uh, I mean, used to make a living mostly by playing the piano and occasionally some kind of something, you know, coming in from composing, but now it's more the opposite. But let's face it, uh, <laughs> I just told David, I said that, that you know I don't. That there are lots of good musician jokes, as we know, mostly about viola players <laughs> <laughs> and trombones and so forth. But and very few jokes about composers because it just isn't funny. <laughs> <laughs> but but there is one I like. It's a, the 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 composition teacher is trying to discourage the student. So he says, well, what do, you, what do you want to get into this for? It's just one frustration after another. They, they never play your music. 
you never get any recognition. You know, nothing ever happens. And, and of course, there's no money in it. And uh, it just goes on year after year until you're 50. And the student perks up and says, uh, uh, and then what happens? <laughs> and the teacher says, well, then you get used to it. <laughs> and that's, I won't tell anymore because they get more depressing. <laughs> but you know, I mean, one doesn't do this for a living. That's the answer. If, if, you, if you write music for a living, you're doing the wrong thing. First of all, if you write music for money, it's probably, you know, it might be, uh, you know, you might, you, might, you might do a good job making commercial music, but if you're trying to do something that is not commercial, then uh, it won't be very good if you're doing it for money. If I, if I make my point clear, you know, it's very simple, but that's the truth. So, uh, like, uh, you know, you, there are certain things that you can't, cannot do for money. First of all, because it's not a very good way of making money. And secondly, because uh, if you do it for money, it's not going to be any good. That's all. And uh, I guess there are many examples of that. I mean, priests, for example, or for that matter, doctors. I, I met in Stanford, I was in Stanford University a few years ago, and there was a Chinese student, a pianist. You know, uh, there are no music majors in Stanford. You can, major in different things, uh, but not music. So, but many of, many students study music, nonetheless. So there was, uh, I would, was doing a piano master class or something, and there was somebody who, a Chinese woman who played quite well. And so I talked to her afterwards uh, uh, because I was interested, uh, you know, and uh, this was in the 90s, so it wasn't, so it was a while ago, before it was clear whether that China was, you know, which way China was going. And um, it was still very much a communist country, if you like. And uh, so uh, I asked her, what, well, what are you really studying? She said, I'm studying medicine. So I thought, well, this is interesting. And then, uh, you know, so I asked her, well, are, are you, you want to become a doctor because you want to help people or because you want to get rich? And she went, hmm, <laughs> get rich. <laughs> you know, so, you know, okay, this is uh, certainly, that's possible, but it's not really a good idea. I mean, uh, there are certain, there's a fun, fundamental contradiction there somewhere, it seems to me. And it certainly is true in the case of uh, composition. You just don't do it for money. So you make a living one way or another. Most people in this country do it by teaching. Well, I would have done that too, gladly, if I had been able to get a job, but I wasn't. So I went to Europe and did it some other way. Well, you also had going for you um, the ability to perform your own music, which was, I think, a, help, uh, a helpful exponent of... Well, yes, it's good if you can, if, if, if you're a performing musician, it's good to bring these two things together as much as possible. I mean, it's good to get paid when you play, and that's actually becoming more and more difficult, you, as you, I'm sure you will agree. Yes. There's less and less money around for culture. That's right. But that's a long story, of that's course. That's a very big story. We could talk about that for the rest of the All night. night. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, one other thing that we're going to be hearing tonight that I would love to hear you say a few words about, if you'd like, would be the... Um, the new piece, the, the new commission uh, work for violin and piano. Well, I did write about it in the program notes. Yeah. And there's not really much more to say about it. Well, how, uh, how much uh, have you composed for that medium before? For violin and piano? Yeah. 
Well, around the time the, of this piece you played last night, I also wrote a sonata for violin and piano, and I think maybe it got lost. Oh, that's At least pity. I don't know where it is. <laughs> it's kind of in the, I remember it's kind of in the style of Bartok or something okay. like that. So, and I tried uh, uh, writing for violin and piano in the meantime. Occasionally, a few fiddle players expressed some interest in it, but I didn't get very far. And as I say, I think it was mainly because, uh, you know, string players are basically just not interested. And in fact, it is a kind of an antiquated or archaic form. I mean, maybe not string quartet, maybe, but say, you know, violin and piano, if you think about it, there isn't really that much. And, and for that matter, you know, I mean, aside from the Shostakovich sonata, what is there for viola and piano, for example? <laughs> I mean, really, do you ever, do you, you must know. Actually, I, I'm focusing so much on string quartets, I'm not really paying attention. But there's actually a lot being written. There may be a lot being written, but it doesn't get played, and that's probably a good thing, too. <laughs> <laughs> is is I, there any significant? I'm, I'm, I'm so biased just towards the string quartet, it really isn't fair. <laughs> That's fine, but what I'm saying is that, yeah, I don't think it's, you know, there may be string quartets, although there aren't that many of those either that, there, you know. There's a lot. <laughs> you just see the piles of submissions we have. That may well be that there is a lot. Somebody said something. <laughs> They were just laughing. <laughs> oh, just laughing, okay. Well, I think uh, in any case, there's whether a medium is played out or not, and there's always something to, to say in it, I think. And it seems like what's an interesting thing is that you've done this uh, for us, and we'll get to hear this tonight. And kind of as a counterpart, we had a, um, a, a collaborative effort with the Phillips Collection, and you'll be playing another violin and piano piece uh, tomorrow there. Well, this is a great idea. I mean, that's Admiral my own Richard. point of view. But, yeah, well, but, we think so too. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think composers would, most composers would agree because uh, there isn't a whole lot of demand for violin and piano. It just seems like it's an archaic form. And uh, uh, therefore, there isn't that much. So, I mean, I don't know. We'll see what it's like. I, I, I have a pretty good idea of what it's going to sound like, and uh, I think it's not so bad. But of course, I'm the last person to, to judge. We'll see. Uh, but, I, but it's a good idea, you know, to, to, uh, to uh, get people to do this, get them back into this form again, because um, it seems to be... Uh, I don't know, I can't get, I mean, you, you probably know more than I do about this, I mean. Uh, well, the library has a, a this, we, this is, uh, it's funded through the McKim Fund and the Library of Congress, which as many of you concert goers have been to lots of our concerts, it's um, a fund that we've had in place for many, many years, um, I think since the late 60s or early 70s. Um, and it's, uh, it's commissioned, I'm trying to think of the number offhand, but a number of very large, of, of, of pieces of, you know, different, different styles, different composers, all those types of things, but including things like the Carter duo and, and uh, other things like that and, and some works by Babbitt. And um, it's, it's a, it has a wide, ver wide variety of uh, opportunities given for that particular ensemble. The fund requires it to be violin and piano. So that's, why, that's one reason why we, we stick with that when we, uh, when we do that. But um, it certainly has, I think, enlarged the body of, of uh, music available for that. I think I asked you when this first arose, I said, well, it is, does it really have to be violin? For instance, couldn't it be viola? <laughs> well, my daughter plays viola. Oh, okay. And of course, I was thinking about that. Mm. And David said, no, it has to be violin and piano. <laughs> so we just need a new fund that covers viola and piano. <laughs> Well, my daughter has this particular point of view. She thinks that the real instrument is the viola. After all, a violino is just a little, a little viola, that's all. <laughs> and the real instrument is the viola, and she thinks that what the, you, know, you should just have a five-stringed 
viola, viola with an E string, and then get rid of the violin. <laughs> How do you feel about that, Charlton? <laughs> Yes, I know that. I know it does. I've exist. even seen some six-string ones. <laughs> well, to her point was that the 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 you know the thing about the violin, the thing, the dramatic part of the violin is the G string, the low string, and she says the the G string is really much better on the viola. <laughs> and uh, you know, actually, it's hard to argue That's right. with that. It's, and you have the C string, <laughs> and then you have on top of that, you have that you know, this fantastic C string. By the way, I did notice your you have a particular way of playing that you know, you, the viola doesn't often stick out ah. in a string quartet, and and you do. <laughs> Was it because of the uh, instrument are, or? Are any of my colleagues here? <laughs> <laughs> no, what, I mean, my question, is, uh, I mean, it, is it, was it the instrument unusually strong or is it just your? Oh, no, they, they have the big instruments. <laughs> the, 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 I mean, last night Ben was playing the Chrysler Guarneri and, and Rick was playing the Betz Strat. I, they should, no, that's probably just me. I like, I like to play loud. Just a powerhouse. Yes. So, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I was impressed by that. I mean, I, I, there's a wonderful quote from Michael Tree, the, the former violist of the Guarneri Quartet, and he said that the violist should always play louder than his colleagues thinks he should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, of course, we're starting to get into the area of viola jokes. Right. I know. <laughs> Well, why don't we take some, some more questions? Yeah. There's a, a microphone that'll come to you. As... Hi, thanks. Um, you said earlier that, or suggested that much new music wasn't very good, but are there any contemporary composers you particularly like or respect? Oh, yeah, yeah, quite a few of them, yeah. Uh, sure, I mean, uh, actually, there are a lot of them. And the interesting thing is that uh, well, it goes up and down, but there, uh, for for a while, there, it looked as though you know composition might be on the way out. After all, there's no reason why it should stick around forever, and uh, we can see the art of painting, for example, is seems to be disappearing, if not already gone. The art of painting with oil colors which has been around for, say, 600 years or something like that, since Giotto, say. Uh, it's, you know, arguably finished. Because now we have something called visual arts. Well, I've never seen a visual art. I don't know what it is. I know what painting is, I know what sculpture is, but uh, Visual arts to me is uh, a euphemism, synonymous with nothing. And uh, the same thing may be happening with music. It's, uh, it's clear to everybody, I think, that the level of creative, the creative level of music has been going down steadily for the last hundred years, if not more. And uh, for instance, Stockhausen was a good composer, but he wasn't as good as Richard Strauss, who in turn was not quite as good as Brahms. So there is clearly a steady decline in quality throughout the 20th century, which is, I mean, you may argue with it. You may say, well, actually, you know, Schoenberg was the greatest composer who ever lived, but it won't convince most people. And of course, he was a good composer, but again, it's so on and so forth. Whereas, interestingly, the level of performance has gone in the opposite direction. The young performers of today are better than Horowitz. And you can hear that on, you can, the, one of the advantages of the internet is that you can just push a button and, and compare. <laughs> Five seconds. And it's quite extraordinary that this is true. 
So it's not at all simple. It's, it's a complex process. Uh, and, and of course, that can be due to many different factors. One of them, for example, is the radio and, uh, techno and uh, technology in general and the media and the monopolization of the music industry, and et cetera, et cetera. I mean, basically, capitalism is not good for culture. Capitalism does not lead to better art, on the contrary. It's destructive in many, many ways, including uh, the, <laughs> the, the area of, of art and culture. It, uh, capitalism, has, uh, is, it's time to get rid of it. We need something else. <laughs> and I mean, that this was not always true, of course. The, the, even in the 19th century, uh, much, much art and culture owes its existence to the uh, the uh, uh, fact that there were rich people around who could spend money on it. And, uh, but today, it is no longer true. It's, uh, it, well, OK, this is, again, a completely different <laughs> thing. The point is, though, that yes, there are, and it's a complex process. And uh, it, 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 I think history goes in both directions at once. It goes forward, and it also goes backwards at the same time. So. Um, for a while, it looked as though there were not really very interesting composers around. And of course, that varies from country to country. Unfortunately, in this country, it's especially true. Uh, a lot of young composers want to be pop stars. It's unfortunate, but it's true. And of course, most of them won't become pop stars, but some of them do. And some of them even get commissions from uh, the Metropolitan Opera or wherever. And uh, uh, of course, you could say, well, this has always been true. Maybe, maybe. Uh, but so, so it's hard. I can't, I can't point to um, really any really significant, interesting young composers in this country. I can point to a few in some European countries. Now, of course, I don't know everything, and I don't. And, and most of the time, I don't live here. So I, there are probably, and maybe there are some young people around whom who are very interesting and who I just don't know. And in, I would hope that would be the case. Probably, Urs if Ursula Oppens were here, she would probably be already protesting loudly and saying, uh, you know, there's this one and this one and this one and this one. And of course. I know from long friendship that it's better not to argue with Ursula. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I would, I would, I, I would be very happy if that were the case. But uh, th there are some, uh, some, a few interesting younger, younger composers around in uh, in certain places. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there's a new kind of generation that appears that. One thing that I think is, was not good was serialism. I think serialism did not help to advance the art of music. It, it had a, definitely a depressing quality on the level of music. Uh, a lot of music was produced that has this academic quality about it, which did not guarantee its future, on the contrary. But even worse, I would say, was what is known as minimalism. It's even worse. And but fortunately now, you have some younger composers who not only don't give a damn about serial music, which is already being forgotten, but even they don't give a damn about minimalism either, and this kind of green mold or fungus is growing on this kind of music, which before the, before the people are even dead. <laughs> At least, you know, Stockhausen and Boulez are now gone. But, <laughs> but, but to see this happening already, you know, this mold growing on people who are still there is kind of frightening. Well, I, I think it's kind of curious that tonight, the, the other piece that we're playing tonight is by Ben Johnston. 
And well, he so was that, a very good composer. And, and still is. And still is. He's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> he is 90, to be fair. Um, but he would, in many ways, would probably be the antithesis of a serialist composer, because his whole uh, paradigm was just intonation. So he wanted pure ratios between the pitches. And so everything was blending in a beautiful way, if not strange way. But um, so the whole idea about serialism and you know each half step being a square root of two, oh no, a twelfth root of two, some crazy you know it's like was completely against his ideas. Well, you know the reality is that these things, these what you're talking about is just theory. It's mathematics. I yes. mean, you look at a real piano. After the piano tuner is done with it, it has absolutely nothing to do with the twelfth root of two. <laughs> it's whatever the piano tuner thinks sounded good. He, he has to make magic with it. And in fact, all pianos are completely out of tune. Right. And if it, if they weren't, they wouldn't sound good. <laughs> uh, actually, I've heard some that have been, but then you can only play specific pieces on them. No, uh, the piano I'm going to play on tonight is uh, a good instrument. I don't know if anybody tuned it <laughs> recently. They probably did, right? They were tuning just as I came in. <laughs> well, I worked on it this morning. It sounded very good, even before it was tuned. It's probably going to sound even better now. But you know, piano tuners have this thing that they talk about, which I have never understood. It's called harmonicity. Mm -hmm. You know what it is? It's I, something about how the spaces between the intervals gets bigger as you go from the middle of the instrument to the outer extremes. But I have never understood what that actually means. I think it just means that piano tuners have found this particular way of making the instrument sound good, and it probably varies from instrument to instrument. Yeah. So this 12th root of two business is, you know, it's like E equals MC squared. You know, maybe it's true. But it's I think it's, uh, for us as string players, well, of course, we're particularly sensitive to those. And so to us, the piano basically sounds out of tune, I'm sorry to say. Well, it is out of tune. Exactly. <laughs> but we hear it. <laughs> so, um, and, and I think, um, so what we are able to do, and, and if you're tuning, because we, we, our tendency is to tune more pure uh, as much as we can. Pure? Oh, don't give me that. Uh, <laughs> tuning more with smaller uh, ratios. Let's put it that way. Ratios? Ratios? Like, so a so fifth, like smaller numbers. Right, so a, a, a fifth being a, a, you know, a three to two match. OK, I'll take your word for it. I okay. never understood these things. so. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> OK. But anyway, Ben Johnston, whether he believes this stuff or not, it doesn't really matter. The fact was that he wrote, has written some good exactly. music. Exactly. Yeah. The music is really fun. How he did it, who cares? I think we have time for just about one more question. OK. Well, well I hope. Uh, no, I'm enjoying myself. Oh, two. No, no, Let's say two. Okay. Or two more questions. Speak into it. Okay, is this good? Why do we have to Not stop scared. anyway? What Any, time anyway, is it? Um, <laughs> well, it's so, only twenty after seven. When is the concert? Um, eight, but we have to we have to open up the house at seven thirty. So. All right. Well. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is a simple one. You mentioned that that if music is composed for money, it won't be good. But when I read the writings of composers of the past, like Dvorak, comes to mind. He was very much writing for money. He would write about how much he was going to get for what piece and how well he was able to deliver it on time. And it was great music. So, and, and other people, I'm sure you can think of others. Has something changed? And if so, why? Well, I don't know that much about Bartok, but uh, some composers are. are Dvorak. Dvorak. Oh, Dvorak, you're talking, not Bartok. Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know that much about him either. <laughs> so so I, I don't know. But uh, some composers are good businessmen. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Philip Glass is, uh, is, is both a, a good composer, I think, you know, although 
he certainly not everything he wrote is, is is that good, but he has done some good stuff, and he's also a very good businessman. So, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I once read an in, uh, interview with him, or I actually saw it on YouTube or some in the internet or something. And somebody asked him something about like, uh, well, you know, a lot of your colleagues are critical of you because you're so successful commercially. And uh, he said, well, actually, I don't see anything wrong with it. What's, what's wrong? What, you know, <laughs> I'm not hurting anybody. Uh, and he ex went on to explain. He said, I, I, you know, I, when I was uh, 15, I worked in my father's record store. And uh, what I, we, we sold records to people. People would come into the store wanting music and gave us money. And I don't see anything wrong with it at all. You know, he just hap he he happened to you know learned how to put the two things together, which of course most composers don't know, and uh, and he does it well. Uh, so uh, it's it's true. I mean, it, it, there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, probably it would be a it would be a good thing if people learned how to sell your music, you know, something I've never really learned, but I guess you can't really teach it. It has to be learned by experience. I'm just, no, I, all I'm saying is that I don't think that should be the, the goal. I mean, you, 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 it's good if somebody pays you. Of course it's good, but if you're doing something for that purpose, well, it's theoretically possible. I mean, Bach wrote his B minor mass, certainly, for money. After all, he was a Protestant. But this is a, he wrote a Catholic mass. <laughs> now, the only explanation for that is that somebody paid him very well, because he wouldn't normally do that, would he? <laughs> the fact was that he was able to do it, and, and people were willing to pay him for it. So I don't know what the details were, but. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I would certainly agree that it's a bad idea to go into music to make money. Exactly. Precisely. I mean, if you do wind up making money, great. But yes. it's like if you go into music for the purpose of making money, that's a dumb idea. Yes, I think that's all I was trying to say. Yeah, exactly. He's, got, he's hit the nail on the head. Does, does, does that answer the question? Yeah. Well, let's take one more. Yeah. I think you had a... There's a story about when he was a taxi driver. Well, I happen to know something about that. Because yeah. I've known Philip since uh, the late 60s. And well, he, so was, he was working as a plumber hmm. down in Soho. A lot of, he had a lot of artist friends who were moving into Soho, and he would come in and put in the toilets. And uh, then he was driving taxis for a while. I was living up on Riverside Drive at 155th Street. And when he was in the neighborhood, he would come by and uh, we would have a drink together. So I, I know that. I mean, I, I've known him for a while. Well, the story I heard was somebody was in his taxi and they said, you know, you have the same name as a famous composer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but that's not my question. My question is that you you have uh, spoken at times about a, a social consciousness or philosophy that informs your music and maybe the 32 variations on the people united will never be defeated is an example of that. But I, I just wondered where you're at. We're you're speaking too close to the microphone. So you're, you're, and you're not speaking loud enough. So. What? Yeah, I'm going to watch so you can hear it. Um, my question was about us right, having a social message in your music. What is the question? <laughs> Whether that's an important thing to you now. I mean, I think. To that, have a social message? Yeah. Well, if you have one, it's important to speak it out. But you don't have to have one. 
it's not necessary to make music, not to have a social message. You can write music about love, death, a lot of things. But if you have a social message and, uh, and, and you can use music as a way of uh, expressing it, uh, it's, it, well, it's like what Jesus Christ says. You know, if you have the light, you should not hide it under a bushel, whatever a bushel is. <laughs> it's the same thing in, in art or music. I mean, uh, you, you, Oscar Wilde says, expression is all. So many people have, and, and, and Pablo Neruda in his autobiography talks about how he meets a worker who recognizes him and says that he too would like to be a poet. And, and Neruda tells him, well, you are a poet. Everybody is a poet because everybody dreams. The only difference between a poet and, and other people is that poets write their dreams down. So that's all it is, really. So, yeah, if you have something to say about society and you, uh, and you can use music to say it, why, this is a good thing. But of course, not everybody does that. And uh, there's no reason why they should. Uh, some people do. I mean, uh, Verdi wrote Nabucco in one of his early operas, and uh, there's a chorus in it of the Jews who are lamenting, who are th crying about how on the shores of Babylon, they're on the shores of, of, of Babylon and so forth, and, and, and thinking about their homeland, and that became uh, the, the uh, Risorgimento. It began the Italian revolutionary movement. And so, uh, you know, uh, it happens. Uh, Pierre de Gaetard was asked by the, the Socialist International to write a worker's hymn for the International, and he brought in a kind of folk song-like melody, and they said, nah, this is too uh, low class. You should do, write something that's some, similar to the Marseillaise. So he went back to the drawing board and he wrote the Internationale, which had a notable career. It's now sort of forgotten, but uh, and he never received a penny from it. A German businessman realized that sometime in the 60s, realized that this song had never been copyrighted. And... <laughs> There was still a few years left in international law, so he went and copyrighted it. And uh, for the next few years, he every time the song was played in a Romanian movie theater, he got money. <laughs> Why not? Well, look, I mean, uh, uh, Warner Communications has just recently a federal judge just a month ago or so, decided that Warner Communications had no right to collect royalties on Happy Birthday, <laughs> which was written by a housewife in Illinois around 1880-something. There's absolutely no reason why <laughs> anybody should get any money for it, but they were doing it. Anyway, we'll... <laughs> Well, just because of the time, we do have a, a concert that starts uh, shortly, and we have to change over the room as well. But please join me in thanking uh, Frederick Jeffsky and Charles and Lee. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.